So tonight we're honored to host Kevin Young, whose resume gro seems to grow by leaps and bounds daily. Uh, in addition to bring, uh, being a poet himself, he was also recently named the poetry editor for The New Yorker, and he is the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem. Uh, to list all of his own books would take more time than I have, but I'll point to a few that we do have uh, available for sale at the front. Uh, he edited The Art of Losing, a collection of poems on grief and healing, and co-edited a remarkable set of collected poems uh, of Lucille Clifton's. He's written one prior nonfiction book, which was a celebrated work of wide-ranging cultural criticism called The Gray Album on the Blackness of Blackness. And his next collection of poetry uh, coming out in a few months is titled Brown, but we do have his most recent release available called Blue Laws, uh, containing pieces over 20 years beginning in the mid-90s, and that was long listed for the National Book Award, uh, much like the book he's here for tonight, uh, which is called Bunk. Uh, as everyone is now all too aware, we're living in a golden age of the hoax, uh, supposed age of information. That's a quote from, from the book. But this book is much more than just a treatise on fake news. Uh, it's covering several centuries of fakery in the U.S., uh, incredibly researched treatments of the Great Moon Hoax of 1835, P.T. Barnum's freak shows, caught on film fairies, uh, and that's all sitting right beside very personal looks at more contemporary hoaxers like James Frey, Rachel Dolezal, Stephen Glass, uh, all hinging on a few really deeply provocative recurring threads, uh, namely how racial hierarchies underlie um, as kind of the unspoken root of all of these hoaxes, and also what separates artifice that's presented as artifice or satire from something that really is trying to pull the wool over your eyes, uh, no matter how benign or inventive that might seem at the time as it's doing so. Uh, I personally think I can confidently state that it's going to be a landmark book because after I've read it, I just keep on grappling with it and coming back to its arguments over and over again in my head. Uh, so with that, I am really excited to introduce Kevin Young to Politics and Prose. Thank you. So, thanks so much. Is that working? You can hear me okay? Uh, it's great to be here. I, I haven't yet read here, so it's a real pleasure. Um, I thought I'd read for a little bit and then we can talk, uh, have some questions. I thought I'd start with sort of the history of the word bunk, which um, is very much married to this notion of uh, race that you mentioned. Um, but you know, I started the book about six years ago, and uh, then it was just a sort of twinkle in the eye, the idea of fake news, um, which now is on the cover and in all of our minds. Um, but I was really interested in the ways that, um, despite what people say, uh, f hoaxes, uh, the kinds of fakery that I came to think of as particularly American, weren't just reliant on the thin line between fact and fiction, or every sort of April Fool's you see a list trotted out of these hoaxes like they were just merely humorous. And I, I started to really think about them as being racial, as being having the exploiting these deep divisions in our culture. Uh, and that's very much what started this book. So I'll just read you a part from the early part of the book and then something from the later part. <coughs> History is bunk, Henry Ford would offer. From one angle, he was right, inasmuch as Barnum and others used bunk to connect the audience to a history, usually a grand American one, that it desperately wished were true. Barnum's brilliance was to understand that wish to see America great again, yet again. But Barnum, the prince of humbug, also remained deeply connected to an assembly line of assumptions, crafting an image of the black body symbolically and literally disassembled before the audience's eyes. The term bunk was itself born of conflict and race. Coined in 1820 from the floor of the 16th Congress when a North Carolina representative continued to filibuster for the Missouri Compromise that made Missouri a slave state. Though the question had been called, he said he had to give a speech for or to Buncombe, uh, his home county, <laughs> um, uh, uh, accounts vary whether he said four or two. Uh, Buncom, B-U-N-C-O-M-B-E, got changed to Buncom, B-U-N-K-U-M, then shortened to Bunk, giving name to that species of fakery, unnecessary flattery, and politicking phoniness that barely believes what it says, 
or worse, comes to believe its bunk never stunk. For Barnum, naming provided much of the power of a show. He knew, using exotic terminology and quoting invented experts, promised his audience a world they might not otherwise get to see. His early touring exhibitions and popular American Museum gave audience members a sense of traveling without leaving their assumptions of touring without being a tourist. This is one of the hoax's chief gambits. Above all, Barnum offered reassurance even as he let the audience glimpse freaks and curiosities beyond category. Visitors got to leave whole, entertained, while offered proof of their being higher up on the scale of humanity. It would be in the notorious exhibition he called, What Is It?, that Barnum would dress a black man in animal hides that proved a symbolic dress. Just months after the publication of Darwin's Origin of the Species in 1860, intrigued visitors would enter to find the answer to the exhibit's question. A black man they were invited to see as a, or as the, so-called missing link in evolution. The New York Mercury's description of the Prince of Wales' visit to the show provides one measure of the figure, quote, whose humiliating likeness to mankind has led certain muddled philosoph philosophers sorry, to insinuate that he is an idiotic Negro. Only a single glance from the bright and very intelligent eyes of the creature is necessary to disprove this absurd guess, while it adds to our bewilderment when we would trace a brute genealogy for him. It is an indication of how the country's centuries views on race didn't free up but only hardened. The Negro gone from handmade to inhuman in a genealogy of brutishness. Uh, now, Barnum's first exhibition, his first sort of popular one, was a woman named Joyce Heth, who he said was uh, George Washington's nursemaid. This, this was in 1835, uh, which would have made uh, her uh, 161 years old which he repeatedly said. Um, it's a fascinating uh, hoax and story and complicated in many ways, but after she died, um, she died probably of exposure uh, about a year later after he started exhibiting her, he uh, had her autopsied in a medical theater um, and charged admission. So Heth could be many things, a curiosity, a machine, almost an animal, but she wasn't quite an it. I want to show a few images. So this, if you can see, is um, sort of what is it as he was depicted. This is actually a slightly later pamphlet when his name became Zip. But you can see there, it says the original what is it. Um, both of these are taken from Harvard's archives where um, I found some of the images after I had written most of the book. Um, and this on the right is a bit more like you would have seen him depicted if you went into Barnum's show. Um, uh, this is what I, uh, some of what I'm talking about, which is this idea of, I'm about to talk about, what is it, the is is lowercase, so I'll explain what I mean by that, with the emphasis purposely not on the is, but the it. Barnum advertised the man he called what is it as a nondescript. The term was actually taken from the newly formed field of natural history used by the likes of Charles Wilson Peale in his groundbreaking museum that at the end of the 18th century helped legitimate and invent museums as institutions, transforming them from private cabinets of curiosities to veritable public entities. The continuum between Barnum uh, Peale's museum and Barnum's American Museum was quite literal. Barnum would purchase and scatter Peale's exhibitions by the middle of the 19th century. So you see here there's uh, what I love is of these sort of playbills from Barnum's American Museum. You can see on the right, uh, that's what it's from. These are two different ones. But what is it has this life with other exhibits that are not so dissimilar? There's one called What Can They Be um, at the time. There's another one up above, you can barely see there, but it says White Negroes or Moors, which was a family he would display. And though the, the sheet on the left is actually the end pages of the book. Now, I've seen pictures of what is it, and the performer, William Henry Johnson, looks very much like a person. 
In no way does he resemble his depictions in the papers of the time or in the advertisements for Barnum's Museum, hunched over as the requisite cannibal or fitting his billing as, quote, the monkey man, an indistinct racial grotesque in an artificial jungle landscape. This is true even of photographs by the famed Matthew Brady and others in which Johnson's hair has been cut into tufts at the crown of his head to emphasize his head's shape, suggesting he was microcephalic. Later photographs would seem to question this, helping us understand how even the photograph, that allegedly reliable document, is shaped, framed, constrained. Let's see, shall we? So this is actually the image I found of him in the Harvard Archive, where he doesn't look at all, of course, like the characters of him as a monkey man, but moreover, he doesn't even look like microcephalic or any of the things that sort of even later writers who are trying to write about him as an interesting figure kind of fall into. And I, it, I was really struck by that um, and his sort of look in this picture, uh, looking back at us across the centuries. So. Uh, I'll just do a little bit more on this. At Barnum, <clears throat> 25 years after his heft beginnings, months after Darwin's revolutionary theory and on, on the eve of the Civil War, would draw a direct line between blackness and the missing link, between primitiveness, primitivism sorry, and primates, still shocks, so it might not surprise. At first blush, at least, such ideas of skull size and savagery couldn't be more different from Peel's state admission but uh, Barnum sought to display what is it as a specimen of inferiority in order to stoke American and white superiority. He further suggested that these were one and the same. With the exception of Heth's hoax and her afterlife, that's in quotes, in the surgical theater and Bowery theater, no exhibition maintained the troubling power of this iteration of Barnum's bunk. What is it became renamed Zip sometime in the 1870s, like, like, uh, likely after the blackface minstrelsy character Zip Coon. A pamphlet called The Life of Zip, which is the pink one you saw before, um, <coughs> whose rose-colored paper cover image redefines grotesque, claims he was from Australia. There's a lot of Australia hoaxes. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, it's like, this is Australia. I mean, if it wasn't Africa, it was Australia. Um, and uh, the lost land that similar freak show exhibits, such as the wild Australian children were claimed to be from. Despite declaring its being, quote, as correct a history of this person as it is possible, the promotion quickly abandons personhood in describing the capture of this creature naked on all fours, this time in the bush by Barnum's agent, revolver in hand. Quote, it was here noticed that this creature was of a dark color, but the actual hue could only be determined after a thorough washing. Yet as a pioneer of the exhibit that sideshow folk termed Pinhead, Johnson did have a lengthy and successful career, continuing well into the 20th century when he often appears more clown-like. By his death in 1926, Johnson was called the Dean of Freaks, enjoying what critic Robert Bogdan calls the longest successful career of any of the sideshow attractions. Johnson's repeated, reported, sorry, last words to his sister indicate how he was well aware of his role. Well, we fooled him for a long time, didn't we? That's amazing. <laughs> um, Unsummarily, Zip was estimated to have been, been viewed by over a hundred million people, and his pop culture descendants can be found in popular comics such as Zippy the Pinhead and comedy routines like Saturday Night Live's Coneheads, who hail from faraway France. An 1885 photograph by Eisenman, a studio that regularly captured circus folk, depicts old Zip Barnum's What Is It? alongside Ashbury Ben, the leopard boy, aged 17 years. The image remains especially powerful in its difference from the nondescript degradations from just a quarter century before. Johnson looks almost regal, furry suit notwithstanding. Zip across his waist like a prize belt. The pair defiantly eye the camera, boxing gloves on as in the promotional photos of Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat posed as pugilists for their groundbreaking collaboration show a century later. 
Ben even has Basquiat's early blonde mohawk haircut. The image is literally reversed. Zip appears backwards on his belt. But if you look closely, Johnson has an image of George Washington pinned to his chest as if it were a war medal. The photograph offers a reversal of Heth's fate. Johnson literally attaching himself to the father of our nation to offer himself up as his own foundational figure. So I'll skip toward what's the end, toward the end at least. Because I was really interested in the history of the hoax, but I became then interested in what I call the hoaxing of history and the way that hoaxes often invent a history greater than it might have been. I think you see that with Joyce Heth. But also uh, now I was interested in the change in the hoax, the way the hoax has gone from often even in something like Heth honoring ancestors or, or thinking about, say, in a fake Shakespeare play, um, creating a kind of honorific legacy um, to one of horror and of pain. And what does that mean now that we've had this shift in the hoax? Um, and besides its proliferation, I think the shift is, is quite interesting. So this is a part of uh, a chapter. I'll jump around in it because it's sort of in little uh, leaps called Blacker Than Now. It's about Rachel Dolezal, who um, you may recall was pretending to be black in Washington State and was the head of an NAACP chapter. Blacker Than Now. It was never easy for me. I was born a poor black child. The beginning of Steve Martin's The Jerk still makes me laugh with its twist on Once Upon a Time. The dissonance between what we know of the white comedian Martin, his relative success, and his obviously false declaration sends, not only, sends up not only the tragic showbiz biography, but the corny black one. And both the worser, the better. It also suggests his character's transformation, his overcoming. After all, he's clearly white now. Not to mention his current lot in which he's a smudged, bummy, apparent destitute. He is, his isn't blackface, but his face half greased is certainly part of the effect. It's a familiar one, in other words, to black people used to watching white people only claim blackness as a poor me stance. Now, why does this jerk remind me of Rachel Dolezal? There's a long-standing American tradition of whites donning blackface or redskins or any other colored mask. Those who wear blackface reduce blackness to skin in order to not be white. The implication, of course, is that black people are just miscolored or extra dark white people. Many, a joke told for my benefit in my Kansas grade school, reinforced the same. Know why black people's palms are white? Though I'm not sure the term used was people. But if you are white but truly feel black, then why do you have to look like it? When Rachel Dolezal's fraud first broke and was simply a joke on black Twitter, um, it isn't a separate app, if you were wondering. It's just um, part of Twitter. I identified some of my favorite Twitter titles for the inevitable anticipated memoir. Their eyes were watching Oprah. <laughs> that one's mine. Imitation of Imitation of Life from Victor Laval. Blackish like me, mine too. Now things done got serious. Every black person has something not black about them. I don't mean something white, because despite our easy dichotomies, the opposite of black is not white. This one likes European classical music. This, that one likes a little bit of country, hopefully the old stuff. This one is the first African-American principal ballerina. This one can't dance at all. Black people know this. Any solidarity with each other is about something shared, a secret joy, a song, not about some stereotypical qualities that may be reproducible, imitable, even marketable. This doesn't mean there aren't similarities across black people or communities or better yet memory, just that these aren't exactly about bodies and not really about skin at all, but culture. Like Rachel Zolazal, I too became black around the age of five. I first became a nigger at nine, so I had me a good run. 
there is a long tradition of passing, of crossing the racial line, usually by going from black to white. You could say it was started like this country by Thomas Jefferson. Did Rachel Dolezal really fool those black folks around her? I have a strange feeling she didn't, that many simply humored her. Those surprised by a white lady darkening her skin and curling her hair haven't been out of the house or online in a while. Um, yeah. um, teaching a class about blackness doesn't mean you are black. Blackness ain't a bunch of facts to memorize or a set of stock behaviors, nor darker skin color neither. While black folks often heal the beat and set it, doesn't mean that when anyone else hears it, she gets to be black. Every church I knew of had a white lady who arrived one day. Ours in Topeka did. After she hung around a while and proved she wasn't a tourist, Mrs. Pete was accepted and seen as part of the St. Mark's AME congregation, even singing in the choir, which was a high bar, as it were. But we never thought she was or somehow became black. She's good people, folks would say. She did get herself a perm, I mean a white curly one instead of a straightened black one. The fact that this clarification is necessary is just one more indication we're awfully mixed up. There's the joke, you didn't get yourself a perm, but a temporary. So when the killer, name withheld, walked into Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston one week after the Dolezal story broke, I am not surprised that the black worshipers there welcomed him. Welcome is an integral part of the African-American Christian tradition, it is especially so in the African Methodist Episcopal one begun over 200 years ago when the Methodist Church prevented blacks, mostly freedmen and women, from praying beside its whites, even pulling them off their knees during prayer. How long did Name Redacted sit there waiting in a prayer circle, deciding to deny the evidence of humanity before him? Nothing, it appears, could have convinced him not to kill blacks who he believed and spilled hate about, preyed on white people, especially women. One suspects he may not have known any women besides his family. After the killings in Charleston, several things happened. Dolezal's story went back to being merely ridiculous. Talk shows moved on to something else, and those who were somehow willed Dolezal sublime retreated. Flags flew at half staff, except the Confederate flag on New Carol I'm sorry, South Carolina State House grounds. It took a black woman, Brittany Newsom, to climb up and take that down. They gave the assignment to a black man to raise the rebel flag back up. Like Sally Hemings, he might not have minded, but he certainly couldn't have refused. Blackness too often veers between two poles in the public eye, opaqueness and invisibility for racist killer. Blackness wasn't just opaque, but conspicuous. It named an enemy and provided a uniform that allowed mass judgment and mass murder. Rachel Dolezal could be conspicuously outraged all the time, filing lawsuits, marching, because she didn't have to save any energy for just being herself. I came out black as a teenager. Before then, I was simply a boy. After that, I was sometimes still. Of course, you can see why anyone would want to be black. Being black is fun. Don't tell nobody. This morning, I woke from a deep Negro sleep, as Leopold Senghor would have it. I then took a black shower and shaved a black shave. I walked a black walk and sat a black sit. I wrote some black lines, I coughed black, and sneezed black, and ate black too. This last, at least, is literal. Grapes, blackberries, the ripest plums. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? Good evening. I enjoyed the book immensely. Oh, thank you. And I, I don't recall if you mentioned uh, President Obama's history the hoaxers in your book, for the most part, tell stories about themselves. Yeah. But other people told stories about President Obama's origins, and I wondered if you could comment on that. Sure, yeah. I talk a bit about um, sort of where folk, fake news has brought us, and I think fake news is, is a lot of what you're talking about, which is, isn't just uh, the fact that there are bots, you know, 
flooding our airwaves and flooding people's inboxes with false information or creating um, fakery that I think is very much pitched to the kind of divisions I discuss in the book. But it's also uh, an accusation, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's something now, now it's not just hoaxing as you point out, but also the accusation that that is a hoax or that is fake news, which often just means news I don't like. Um, and so I, I was really wrestling with that and um, I ended up thinking about this idea of, you know, are we now in this half hoax world where everything is either ha somewhat fake or always fake or some version of, of that. Um, and it was something I, I really wrestled with in the book, and, and I think birtherism uh, plays into that, definitely. Hi, thanks for being here. Thanks. Uh, I, I was wondering, in, in terms of fake news and hoaxes, is there anything that you've found or any opinion that you have through history of conditions that need to exist for those things to, to really take hold? Yeah, my whole book is very much about that. Like, why do hoaxes happen at certain times and appear to be worse than others and better in other times. Um, and I, I started out by trying to say, well, yes, I think things are worse now. And reading a lot about them and reading the proliferation of hoaxes, I not only came to the realization that they were uh, more hoaxes now, but that they were worse in their sort of duration, but also in their uh, outlook. You know, they're very much now worser, as I said in that uh, quote. Um, I think there's a number of conditions and a number of reasons why now, but they're, and they very much are uh, in a continuum with why then. I think in Barnum's time, there very much was a sort of change in technology and also a, a, a sort of unstable notion of, say, the nation. You know, here we are um, just 60 years or so after the declaration is signed, and Barnum was able to capitalize on thinking about George Washington specifically um, as a founder of our nation and, and really have people think about what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to sort of caretake that legacy of, that Washington left us? And what better person to embody it but this woman who nursed him, literally. Um, of course, she was fake, and of course, she might have been enslaved, and uh, all these things that I think get at another kind of unspoken thing that the hoax is about often. Um, and so those kind of shifts in technology and also uncertainty about where we are and who we are, I think are very much with us now. And um, I trace in the book the relation of the penny press, which is very much where Barnum placed a lot of his mm -hmm. hoaxes and where the news of hoaxes, not just his, but the moon hoax, um, which I talk about in the book, um, at the time relate to the internet now and how does the internet affect it. Um, it isn't so much that I think the internet is bad or did something to us, we invented the internet, um, but that it provides a forum and a little bit of destability for us to work out what I think had been a growing crisis in narrative, a narrative crisis that I trace. And in the absence of a sort of single story, I think that we fall for or go for a story that sort of makes sense, that mm -hmm. has a kind of unity. Um, and a lot of these stories are about race. Um, and so how do we get past that and think about that is, is also where the book mm -hmm. ends up. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I worked on a um, tobacco case against tobacco and, and we looked a lot at marketing mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that's, that is true in that instance and I believe is becoming more true in the world in large is just testing every possible idea that can sell mm. in the sense of like I keep wondering does Steve Banyan condu conduct you know marketing the marketing of the um, um, even calling them alt right gives them more credit sure. immoral ideas does he does he do, do they do marketing on immoral ideas or the fact that you can get counts off of the, I guess you can get counts off of things that are on the internet. Um, it's sort of the, it's a way of shaping bad ideas to make them appealing. Test them I guess out. is what I'm talking yeah. about. Test market a bad, a really <laughs> bad idea. Sure, online. Um, you know, before it 30 was days just or sort of, I mean, before, in the society of, say, the, the 19th century, 
you know, the, everybody knew, everybody might have been a, might have been much more communal on their bad ideas. <laughs> uh, but now, with the with a, you know larger parts of the community hopefully breaking away from bad ideas, hmm. now we can go out and with, now with the. So anyway, I just wondered whether this was something that you thought about or whether you think it's, or did you look at, at what kind of marketing sure. goes on? Uh, I think it's a great question. Um, I don't think about marketing per se so much, but I do think about this idea of what does it mean, you know, to have a kind of mass hysteria, you know, um, or mass belief. Um, I, I talk a little bit, and I, I have some slides of some of the, Derek's who populated, um, you know, asylums in France and how they, this is my favorite one, um, you might not be able to see, but she's actually between two chairs, like mm. floating almost, but she's supposed to be part of the hysterics, uh, you know, her process. Um, and, you know, this was very much something that I tie to sort of our, our current hoaxes around race, but also around gender and what's it mean and how do we think about it. I also think a lot about the 19th century and the ways that their audiences might have been different from our audiences and might have been in some ways more sophisticated because what I was sort of writing about in the bunk part is that Barnum, I think, offered us a kind of democratic option. You could decide for yourself uh, and you could be the expert. You know, you kind of promised that. And my worry is that now we're in a world where there are no experts. Um, you know, the experts are, expertise is bad. It's actually what you know makes you not qualified to be head of a department of the government. <laughs> so um, it's a little related to what you're talking about, and I have seen some of the phenomena you mentioned. Where, uh, but I, I sort of relate it more to the idea of kind of the difference between a hoax and humbug, which I think is meant to entertain us, humbug, and a hoax and bunk, which isn't really even trying to be believable, it's just sort of disinformation, you know, that clogs the airwaves. And if it catches on a little bit, then all the better. All the better. <laughs> so there is a kind of distinction I'm trying to make within thinking about hoaxes and hysteria and how we believe, because really my, the, I think I started out the book thinking, okay, I want to write about how, why people deceive each other and what that is, but I really came to understand that we need to understand why we believe things and, and why we fall for things and what they tell us about ourselves when exposed. Um, what does it mean that people thought that hysteria had like 10 set ca uh, you know, modes that you would go through and that one was leth lethargy, but it meant you were like, you know, perfectly uh, planing or whatever <laughs> across a... Uh, 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 two chairs. So th I started thinking about that a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Where did you, how did you decide, I mean, I guess it, a lot of it comes down to a deadline, but how did you decide where to end with the book? Because it, it just, I mean, obviously we're seeing with, as weeks go on, I mean, just recently we have um, Washington Post reporters being, sure. uh, yeah, um, Project Veritas, et cetera. So how do you decide where to, to draw the line like this this has to end somewhere it, yeah. it's going to end here someone asked me if i was going to write bunk part two you know <laughs> um i think it would be uh long as well um i you know really what happened is uh i took a job at schaumburg it was last summer and i realized and probably had realized before then there's a new one every week i mean i could just keep adding the scarier thing was that i realized that i was adding just like a, and this other example you know because the framework or the thinking I had done was very much about some of what happened. Um, so uh, it was about last summer that I f uh, decided to wrap it up and finished a draft and then I wrote the afterword um, sort of right after the election, which also was my birthday. So um, it was a sort of intense like time, right? You know, uh, um, and I, I think that what I came to think about is where are we now? And that was more interesting in a bigger sense than one event or one person or um, but thinking about what I call the age of euphemism and what it means to be in a world where we're not saying what things actually are um, and how long has this world been with us and what can we do to fix it and what did you decide? <laughs> uh, what did I decide 
Um, I decided he's been with us a long time in a way. I mean, in a way, Barnum's world is our world. He kind of was the preeminent showman of his day. I think there's some of our day. Um, I think that there's an interesting kind of link between the experience of, say, watching a reality show now and what it, what it must have been like to see his exhibitions. I don't think people went in and said, oh, there's a mermaid, you know, which was really a monkey sewed to a fish's tail. Um, but they thought about what's it mean to be fake and what's real. And you know, they were kind of playing with some of these notions that I think we get in a reality show. And what's interesting is what does it mean that our present came out of a reality show um, in many ways? And what does it mean that those kind of linkages are there? And so I talk a bit about uh, that. Um, I hate to say you have to buy the book to find out, but um, you have to at least leaf through it to think about, <laughs> to think about it because I think it's a complex answer. We have, on one hand, I think to be um, honest with each other, but I also think we have to not be cynical. Um, I think that some of the f gullibility that we see actually comes from a cynicism, from believing not just in a half hoax world, but a full hoax one, that everything is fake. It's very easy to then, if, you, if everything is fake, you can very easily dismiss most things, you know? Um, if you say, well, what is real and how do I get to it? And how do we understand each other? That's really the, the so solution to me in some way. You're welcome to ask, they, they're live streaming, so please go to the mic. Uh, question. Yeah. In your research for this, did you, over the time, does this have some macro level of cyclicity to it? And my, I asked that because it seems like things are insane right now. And do yeah. you get as a population to a point where it gets so bad you kind of snap yourself out of it and, and self-correct? Well, I'd like to say yes. Um, I think that definitely there are times when it's worse and better. Uh, the 1830s are bad. The end of centuries tend to be really bad. Um, you know, the 1890s. Uh, think back to like the witch hunts of the 1690s, you know, like you can kind of almost point to these millennial like or century uh, moments. Um, but like there aren't, for instance, a ton of notable hoaxes in the 1960s. You know, why is that? What is that about? Um, and I talk a little bit about why, and, and one of the things I think is a kind of, even though it's a time of tumult, in a way that's sort of addressing these issues of the divisions between us, or at least sort of dealing with it. It's really only sort of in the early 70s and Watergate and beyond that you start to see the rise. And I'd say about 20 years ago or so, 25, and I trace that, um, it gets even worse. And um, I like to think we're on the edge of it. I do think that things like the Post, who I think has been doing a bang up job, uh, not just because it's a hometown paper, but um, from, you know, for the last while, whether it's sort of denying people are trying to get them hoaxed or helping expose sort of sexual creeps in our midst. You know, I think those are kind of examples of where we're starting to believe in journalism a bit, mm -hmm. even if it's not wholly. Thank you. Thanks. So my question, um, my, specialist, my specialty is Yiddish, Yiddish culture, and, and in the uh, early uh, experience of America for Yiddish immigrants from Eastern Europe, the, the term America Bluff be, was, became commonplace. Wow. And I think it has its roots in, in capitalism, that, in, that you'll sell anything that you can <laughs> sell and sure. say anything to sell that. Yeah. And I wonder if that's still true. <laughs> uh, do people say anything to sell things? Yes, they absolutely do. Um, do I think, I, I mean, I think your broader question, excuse me, is one I think about, which is, is there something American about the hoax? And what I've come to think is not necessarily that, you know, America didn't invent hoaxing, but they kind of perfected it. Um, and so what does that mean? How, how does that affect us? And why do we fall for that. And as I've sort of said in the book, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with sort of self-reliance, um, self-invention, um, kind of big themes. But I, I think a lot of it does have to do with this bugaboo not being able to be mentioned, uh, but only as a peculiar institution of race and slavery. And how do we sort of uh, address this thing that we can't quite speak of? Um, it's sort of the ultimate euphemism. And I at first started to think about the ways that hoaxes were often about race. But then I also started thinking about the way race is ultimately a hoax. It's something fake that uh, pretends to be real. 
Um, this doesn't mean it doesn't have real effects. And in fact, I think because it's not exactly real, the effects are even more troubling and tr dramatic. And to see those kind of grow up together, the hoax and race, um, because even the word hoax comes in the 18th century, in the middle of the century, we, we know sort of almost the decade. Um, and the, our conception of race, modern idea of it, I think is really fortuitous, not an accident, also sort of telling about how we're linked um, and how these ideas are linked in our imaginations. The sort of last thing I'll say is, you know, I started out thinking a lot about um, how hoaxes damage the truth and what they do to the truth, and I think that's still true. But what I really ended up thinking about, besides race and all the things I mentioned, is the way that the hoax threatens the imagination and the way that our art, our ability to believe in the things that we make up that can sustain us, actually the hoax threatens. And, and I talk about it a lot in the book. What does it mean to think only something real can affect us? Um, and, and I think that de-emphasis or, or danger to the imagination is a very real one. So it isn't just trying to recapture our sense of truth. It's also trying to recapture our sense of art and the imagination. Um, and I, I hope that's where we're headed. Thanks so much. <laughs>